The program on this tape is numbered A303-5, stroke and it's part of the Open University course, The Problems of Philosophy. It is linked with units 7 to 8 of that course, and its title is A Debate on the Existence of God. This program is edited from a famous radio discussion between Bertrand Russell and F.C. Coppleston, S.J. This discussion is reproduced in full in the set book, The Existence of God, edited by John Hick. The program is introduced by Stuart Brown, Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at the Open University. BBC production is by Richard Callanan. The program starts after the tone signal with the voice of Stuart Brown. Its approximate duration is 19 minutes. In 1948, the BBC broadcast a debate between Bertrand Russell and F.C. Copleston concerning the existence of God. Lord Russell, who died in 1970, will be remembered for many reasons, not least for his important contribution to the development of logic. Father Copleston is a Jesuit priest, now principal of Heathrop College and professor of the history of philosophy in the University of London. Russell's position in the debate is that of an agnostic. Copleston's position is that of a believer who holds that the existence of God can be proved. We shall listen in a moment to an edited portion of this debate, that part in which Russell and Copleston discuss what is sometimes called the argument from contingency. This is a form of cosmological argument and I expect you will notice several points of resemblance between the argument offered by Copleston and the cosmological argument of Richard Taylor discussed in the correspondence material. Like any form of cosmological argument, the argument from contingency begins with an empirical premise, one whose truth is known through experience. This premise is, of course, that there are contingent things. A contingent thing, according to Copleston, is one which does not contain within itself the reason for its existence. If we are to explain why a particular contingent thing exists, we must mention, in so doing, some other thing or things on which its existence depends. Those who accept the argument from contingency hold that we must, in the long run, have recourse to some non-contingent or necessary thing if we are to explain the existence of contingent things. Either the principle of sufficient reason is false, and there is in the end no sufficient explanation why contingent things exist, or else there is something having a property peculiar to God, namely of containing within itself the reason for its existence. If we find it unacceptable that the existence of contingent things should in the end have no explanation, we must, it is argued, conclude that there is a God. We join the discussion at the point where Copleston states the argument from contingency in the form in which he himself favours it. Suppose that I give a brief um, statement and then we go on to discuss it. Well, for clarity's sake, I divide the argument <coughs> into distinct stages. Uh, first of all, I should say, we know that there are at least some beings in the world which do not contain in themselves the reasons for their existence. For example, I depend on my parents and now on the air, on the food, and so on. Now, secondly, the world is simply the real or imagined totality or aggregate of individual objects, none of which contain in themselves alone the reason of their existence. There isn't any world distinct from the objects which form it any more than the human race is something apart from the members. Therefore, I should say, since objects or events exist, and since no object of experience contains within itself the reason of its existence, this reason, um, the totality of objects, must have a reason external to itself, and that reason must be an existent being. Well, this being is either itself the reason for its own existence, or it is not. If it is, well and good. If not, then we must proceed further. But if we proceed to infinity in that sense, then there's no explanation of existence at all. So, I should say, in order to explain existence, we must come to a being which contains within itself the reason for its own existence, that is to say, which cannot not exist. 
This uh, raises a great many points, and it's not altogether easy to know where to begin. But I think that perhaps in answering your argument, the best point with which to begin is the question of a necessary being. The word necessary, I should maintain, can only be applied significantly to propositions, and in fact only to such as are analytic, that is to say, such as it is self-contradictory to deny. I could only admit a necessary being if there were a being whose existence it is self-contradictory to deny. Uh, I should uh, like to know whether you would accept Leibniz's division of propositions into truths of reason and truths of fact, the former, the truths of reason, being necessary. I certainly should not subscribe to what seems to be Leibniz's idea of truths and reason and truths of fact, since it would appear that for him there are in the long run only analytic propositions. I don't want to uphold the whole philosophy of Leibniz. I have made use of his argument from contingent and necessary being, basing the argument on the principle of sufficient reason, simply because it seems to me a brief and clear formulation of what is, the, in my opinion, the fundamental metaphysical argument for God's existence. But, uh, to my mind, a necessary proposition has got to be analytic. I don't see what else it can mean. And analytic propositions are always complex and logically somewhat late. Rational animals are animals is an analytic proposition. But a proposition such as, this is an animal, can never be analytic. Well, in fact, all the propositions that can be analytic are somewhat late in the build-up of propositions. Take the proposition, if there is a contingent being, then there is a necessary being. I consider that that proposition, hypothetically expressed, is a necessary proposition. If you are going to call every necessary proposition an analytic proposition, then in order to avoid a dispute in terminology, I will agree to call it analytic, though I don't consider it a tautological proposition. But the proposition is a necessary proposition, only on the supposition that there is a contingent being. That there is a contingent being actually existing has to be discovered by experience. And the proposition that there is a contingent being is certainly not an analytic proposition. Though once you know, I should maintain, that there is a contingent being, it follows of necessity that there is a necessary being. The difficulty of this argument is that <coughs> I don't admit the idea of a necessary being and I don't admit that there is any particular meaning in calling other beings contingent. These phrases don't, for me, have a significance, except within a logic that I reject. A contingent being is a being which has not in itself the complete reason for its existence. That's what I mean by a contingent being. You know as well as I do that the existence of neither of us can be explained without reference to something or somebody outside us, our parents, for example. A necessary being, on the other hand, means a being that must and cannot not exist. You may say that there is no such being, but you will find it hard to convince me that you do not understand the terms I am using. If you do not understand them, then how can you be entitled to say that such a being does not exist, if that is what you do say? Uh, well, I will say that what you have been saying <coughs> brings us back, it seems to me, to the ontological argument that there is a being whose essence involves existence, so that his existence is analytic. That seems to me to be impossible. And uh, it raises, of course, the question, what one means by existence? Uh, and as to this, I think a subject named can never be significantly said to exist, but only a subject described. And that existence, in fact, quite definitely, is not a predicate. 